Let's consider axial deformation and thermal stress. There are two types of axial deformation we'll talk about. There's elastic and thermal deformation. And elastic deformation is something that's caused by the application of external forces. Even uh, reaction forces can cause uh, deformation. Also, changes in temperature are what cause thermal deformation. So when something heats up, typically expands. Uh, when it cools down, it typically shrinks. What we're going to study will apply to any load carrying member if the member is straight with constant cross sections. So the, the equation on the right is what we're considering. The material is homogeneous. In other words, it's the same and uniform throughout. The load has to be directly axial. It can't be offset to one side and the stress has to be below the proportional limit. In other words, the material has to be behaving as a linear spring. Okay, We can't have a spring, imagine a spring that has a, a varying diameter or varying wire size. That spring's stiffness is going to change along the length of the spring. In the same way, our members have to be uniform. They have to have the same cross-sectional area along the entire length, same material properties along the entire length, and so forth. Plus, we can't stretch the, the spring, these, these materials, so far that they go, you know, they start to yield, that they go outside of the uh, proportional limit. In that case, here's the equation we will use to figure out how much deformation results from a given load. So you notice that the external load, F, is in the numerator, numerator of the equation. Obviously, the longer the member is, the more it's going to stretch, right? So the deformation is proportional to the original length of the member and of course L is the original length not the deformed length of the member. E is an inherent material stiffness that's basically what it is it's the elastic modulus that we've already seen and it depends just on the material and how stiff the material itself is and then the cross-sectional area A in this case would just be a circle. The principle of superposition is a very important concept we will revisit it later the idea here is that you can split up the deformation into the various causes. In other words, if you look at this picture, we've got a pipe hanging from the ceiling. So it's welded to the ceiling, and we've got a 2,500 pound load on the bottom called F3, and then two uh, forces F1 and F2 of 8,000 pounds attached at point B. Now, the idea behind superposition is that the 2,500 pound load does not affect the 8,000 pound loads either one. They don't affect each other and they don't affect the 2,500 pound load. In other words, the way the material responds is just the sum of the way it would respond to all of those loads independently. So if you think about the deflection of point C, obviously it's going to move down, right? So the, the total deflection is simply going to be the deflection due to F1 and F2, but also the uh, deflection due to F3. So if we could calculate what the deflection of point C would be just under the action of one force, say F3, and then add to that the deflection of that point under the influence of F1 and F2, and I've, I've grouped them together, but technically they could have their, each could have a separate turn. But anyway, we can add all those deflections together and we'll get the same thing as if all loads, well, the same thing as when all loads are applied at, at the same time. So it's, it's the net effect of all of those loads. Now for thermal deformation, there's a really important parameter called the coefficient of thermal expansion. You'll hear it abbreviated in industry as CTE all the time. In particular, what automotive manufacturers are concerned about and, and other areas is CTE mis mismatches, areas where you've got two pieces of material that are somehow attached to each other, either bonded together or fastened together. And since they have such large changes in thermal expansion as the temperature changes, one wants to, to deform a lot more than the other. So numerically or, or quantitatively, what is the coefficient of thermal expansion? Well, it's just a change in a dimension with a unit change of temperature. Now, the way it's measured, you don't really want it to depend on what unit system you're using. So it's for example, how many inches of deflection there is due to, say, changing by one degree, okay, versus the original length of the item. So it's a lot like strain, except that it has units of temperature in the denominator. And it really, it's length per length per temperature. But the length per length units, and even, well, not really dimension, but the units cancel. So a lot of times we, we don't say that. It's just one over uh, temperature, one over degree. So per, 
degree Fahrenheit change, what's the, you could look at it as a percentage, right? What's the percentage stretch? In SI, it's a millimeter per millimeter per degree Celsius, or simply uh, inverse degree Celsius. Now, here's some representative coefficients of thermal expansion, and uh, they are given for several different materials, uh, mainly metals, but you notice at the bottom there's some glass, some wood, just pine in particular, and concrete. And what you might notice about this is that these are all positive values. And so you, what, what does that mean? Well, that means that there's an increase in length per inch of original length, right? Uh, for every increase in temperature, it's a positive thing, right? Whereas if the material were to shrink as it was heated, then that would be a negative coefficient of thermal expansion. So are there any? Actually, there are. Ice and water in some regions of temperature do have negative coefficients of thermal expansion. Water in particular, when it is not frozen, uh, has a negative coefficient of thermal expansion from zero degrees up to four degrees. And then once it's ice in the solid phase, below about 250 degrees Celsius, it also has a negative coefficient of thermal expansion. I don't know how far down that goes. I don't know if you continue decreasing the temperature, how far down that negative coefficient of thermal expansion goes. Of course, negative 250 degrees is pretty low already, so this graph may actually include all the way down to negative 273, which would be absolute zero. So maybe, in fact, this does go all the way down to, to an absolute zero temperature. I'm not sure. But it's just interesting that some materials do have negative coefficients of thermal expansion, but they are by far the exception, not the rule. Now, you don't really talk about the coefficient of thermal expansion when you're comparing, say, a solid to a liquid. So you may know that in thermostats, for example, the wax material, when it melts, changes its density. And to say that it has a coefficient of thermal expansion is not, I think, fair because there's been a phase change that occurred there as well. Now, you can certainly say there's a different density of the solid versus the, the liquid, but um, anyway. So there are some, but most of the time we're talking about coefficients of thermal expansion that are positive, and most of the time we are interested in matching coefficients of thermal expansion. So look at steel. Steel has a coefficient of thermal expansion. And I'm going to abbreviate that pretty quickly, CTE. Let's just use that from now on. CTE of about 6 to 6.5 times 10 to the negative 6 per degree Fahrenheit. And concrete has a CTE of 6 times 10 to the 6 per degree Fahrenheit. So it's interesting that, that concrete and steel match so closely. This is the reason that steel reinforcement is good reinforcement for concrete. Because if you think about rebar, it has ridges on it, and those ridges are there to, to lock into the concrete and, and make features that attach to the concrete. And if there was a, a large mismatch in CTE, there would be extremely high stresses developed between the concrete and the steel, and one of them would give and I know which one it would be, it would be the concrete, because there would be uh, uh, tensile stresses in the concrete, and concrete really doesn't have hardly any tensile strength. So if we wanted to uh, quantify how much the expansion would be, then we've got an equation that would do that for us. Delta, the amount of expansion, is equal to the coefficient of thermal expansion alpha, the original length of the member L, and the change in temperature delta T. And this is something you should mark in your book as well as the coefficient of thermal expansion table I just showed you. So imagine that you've got some material that's held in place between two fixed rigid supports where it simply cannot expand. Then what happens? Well, then it will develop very high stresses and very high forces trying to force expansion. And so to calculate that magnitude of stress, we'll use the elastic coefficient of the material, the uh, CTE, the coefficient of thermal expansion alpha, multiplied by the change in temperature, and that will actually give us the stress uh, that, that is experienced. Now, in the real world, what happens is the rigid supports typically are not really rigid. They're pretty close, but not perfect. And so they will deflect some to relieve some of the stress, and the member then gets to uh, expand a little bit uh, in order to uh, not generate as much stress. And uh, there's kind of a balance between those two extremes. Now, one thing about these equations is they they only work when the stress doesn't called yielding, cause yielding or fracture. And if we're talking about something that's under compression, which would be in the case of you know a positive CTE material increasing temperature, it's trying to push out, so it's in compression. If there's some fixed rigid support, uh, 
then if it's a long thin member it might buckle and that also can relieve stress so be careful when using these equations that I've shown the slides because they don't work if the geometry changes significantly